Did a race even happen if there were no photos of it? If you are a Formula One fan or a motorsport fan in general, it is highly likely that you have seen photos from award-winning photographer Jamie Price. Jamie has traveled around the world photographing at high-profile motorsport events, photographing for his clients, which include teams, manufacturers, and individual drivers. I had the chance to catch up with Jamie right before the Rolex 24 in Daytona to ask him questions about his career path so far and what he plans on doing in the future. If you're an aspiring motorsport photographer or you just want to know a little bit more about the industry, this one's for you. So you are currently in Daytona. Give us a little rundown. Who are you shooting with this weekend? Basically, what, what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I'm in Daytona, Florida for uh, my eighth Rolex 24-hour race, which is crazy. This will be my 15th 24 in my career, which is crazy to think that I've spent more than two weeks of my life standing track side shooting these endurance races. But this will be my eighth Rolex 24 hour and they have a capacity field of 61 cars. We've got GTD cars, which are basically just GT3 cars. We have prototype cars from LMP3, LMP2 and Daytona Prototype International, which is known as DPI. And that's just a crazy lineup of amazing drivers from all over the world that have tons of various backgrounds from DTM champions to IndyCar champions, IndyCar drivers that are regular series drivers. We've got like eight or nine drivers that are pretty recent Formula One drivers as well. Kevin Magnuson's out here and Marcus Erickson's out here, Kimoe Kobayashi. It's a just insane field, but I have the pleasure of working with a couple of manufacturers. So I'm working with Lamborghini, which is one of my biggest clients. And then Aston Martin Racing is having me do their program. They have four cars. Lamborghini has four cars. I'm working with Toyota in one of their support series events. So we have a four hour race before the 24 hour race for another series. So I'm doing Toyota. Uh, um, in that and then a team that's running in that event and then three of the teams four teams that are running in the 24-hour race and now like five or six drivers in the 24-hour race so it's busy I have a friend of mine that's coming in to help me for race week so I don't drown myself in photography and editing and uploading and remembering who needs to get what because it's a lot to remember honestly but it's, I'm very, very, very thankful to have such an incredible list of clients that they trust me and they want me to, to be their photographer. And of course, I want to jump eventually into the F1 side of your career as well. But I, I know that as a young kid, you were very interested in F1 and got to go to, I believe your first race was in Indianapolis in 2005. But I want to hear a bit more about how that kind of shifted and how you became such a big fan of endurance racing and these different spec series. I was always a Formula One fan as a kid. I mean, I was a subscriber to F1 Racing Magazine. I played video games. I was just a diehard. And back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was really falling in love with Formula One as a sport, it was a lot harder to get access to it as just an American. Like back then, it wasn't easy to to be an F1 fan. It's still not easy as an American to be an F1 fan. So I remember in college, I used to watch the races on like live timing and scoring that they had on F1.com. And there wasn't any video or anything. There wasn't even an option for it, but you could just look at the, the timing and scoring and how it would like change. And you could tell, oh, Michael Schumacher's like, 0 0.025 seconds behind Fernando Alonso. This is a good race, but sports car racing, I kind of found a little bit after the Formula One stuff, but I I watched the Truth in 24 documentary, which is now on YouTube. It was it was just mind blowing. I was like, this is a whole other side of car racing that I really didn't know that much about. There's all these manufacturer teams, and and the racing is just as good as it is in F1, and there's great drivers. And I don't know, I found it very fascinating. And then I was able to go to my first uh, endurance race, actually as a credentialed photographer, but I just immediately fall in, lo in love with it. As soon as I watched Truth in 24, I just thought it was a brilliant documentary. But then as soon as I discovered endurance racing, I've tried to be like a huge advocate for F1 is great, but there's more than just F1 in the motorsport world that people can enjoy. And uh, you had kind of an interesting path getting into motorsport photography because you started off in horse racing. In your words, you, you switched from horses to horsepower. So I kind of want to know a little bit more about that. And how did you basically make that switch? Was it a natural transition or was it pretty much like a 
complete career upheaval. It was a pretty natural transition, actually. So I spent a good part of my high school life as a as a jockey. I think when I was like 15 or 15, my dad asked me if, he, if I wanted to go down to one of the training centers in South Carolina, which is maybe an hour drive from Charlotte, where I live. And we went down there and I just I loved it. Like I thought it was great. And it was an adrenaline rush. Like I've never felt before. Like you have an animal that is very smart, very intelligent, very powerful, like with a lot of speed and there's just so much to it. So I rode 50 races and had 11 wins, but I loved it. I loved riding, but when I, when I got my first camera in 2008, it just became something that I wanted to bring my camera to the races I was at. And I already had the access. It was, I was an athlete. I was a jockey. So I could just walk out on the racetrack with my camera and take pictures of the horses. Horse racing is a lot like car racing used to be. It's, it's kind of more like what motorcycle racing is now, but it's a lot like what car racing used to be, where there's an open face helmet and you have all these personalities and you have so much color and you kind of have the danger aspect too. And when I discovered that I was okay at photography, I kind of took horse racing. I was like, you know, maybe this is, this is how I like get to where I want to go with car racing by, by taking pictures of, of horse racing and doing the best that I can at it, but also networking my way along, trying to do like slow shutter speed pans, like I'd seen in the F1 racing magazine stuff and apply that to horse racing. And it was really cool. And it taught me a lot. I felt like this is something that is very applicable to car racing. And I think I can take this and transfer it into race cars. And I also read somewhere that one of your first accredited races was actually at a lawnmower race. So I would love to hear more about that. It feels like a lifetime ago, but I I worked um, when I was really starting my career and not just my career, but learning about photography because I did two different newspapers where I was a photography intern and one of them was the with the Charlotte Observer in Charlotte North Carolina and part of the assignments that we had every week is obviously they would tell us to go do some things like there's there's a story about this we need pictures of this go do it and there was also like more of a features section of things where you know it was up to us to go find something interesting to photograph go find something that you want to cover and I kind of like research stuff in North Carolina. And I've discovered like a lawnmower racing series that runs in Ellerbee, North Carolina, which is like the middle of nowhere. It was the still to this day, one of the coolest things I've ever seen with my own two eyes. And yeah, they're John Deere's and Honda's and Kawasaki's and whatever, but it's not just doing like five miles an hour with a, a mower deck. Like they basically strip these down put an exhaust on it and they're doing 60 miles an hour around uh like a, it's not even a quarter mile dirt track it's like a just a bull ring kind of thing the riders are not athletes they're just dads and brothers and moms and sisters that like throw a bicycle helmet on or like a motocross helmet and goggles on a friday night in ellerby that's the place to go like and i was the only photographer like you can imagine these kind of events there's nobody there so i covered it and i documented it and i did a couple different races but that one race they took the pictures and my assignment editor was like this is crazy and i was like yeah this is awesome so i got to cover lawnmower racing a couple different times i did some track day stuff i found a racetrack in south carolina and found that found out about this track and they had like a track day with ferraris and motorcycles and corvettes and there was like one guy with an open wheel car that to me kind of looked like a formula one car and i was like yes but the lawnmower racing was very, very cool. I actually have thought about it several times. I would love to go back and shoot another one. Now with like my professional camera equipment that I know how to use, like at the time, I really didn't even know what I was doing. I can very much vouch that I would love to see more of that. I think it's it's just so quintessentially like motorsport fans you find a way to do it you find a way to have a good time and I'm sure over the years like from getting that very first camera to now the full setup that you have lots of upgrades lots of different equipment so can you walk us through on average just how much you need to bring with you to a race weekend yeah it's a lot so it's kind of changed a little bit over the years as I've figured out what I need and what I don't need the problem with car racing it's a problem but it's also a good thing is for safety they have us very far removed from the track especially at formula one races the tracks are big so you need like a really long lens to make the pick the cars look bigger in the frame there's times when you can use a, a wider focal length to make the 
car look smaller and that's like done on purpose. But a lot of times you want the car to fill the frame or be like really the center of the action in the picture. So you need that long telephoto, which I, I bought a, a 500 millimeter uh, lens. And before that I had a 400 millimeter and then I have a 70 to 200 millimeter. I have a 24 to 70, a 14 to 24, and then a couple different like other lenses that are between those focal lengths that I kind of choose what I'm using and when I'm using it. Like I won't walk around the paddock necessarily with my 500 because it doesn't make sense to shoot cars being worked on or mechanics working on cars with a 500. I don't need that it really except on the track or on pit lane. So when I'm walking around pit lane or the paddock, I'll shoot with a 70 to 200 or an 85 millimeter. A 35 millimeter is what, another favorite. That's not, you don't need the super focal lengths to get that kind of stuff. But the track side, it's hard. Like you're just, you're carrying around like really heavy stuff on your shoulders and back on at the end of Sunday, I'll feel like I've had an elephant sitting on my shoulders for 40 hours and I'll desperately need a trip to the chiropractor or someone to crack my back. And I think that's something that some fans don't necessarily realize that your job encompasses so much more than just rolling up to a track and taking photos. You have to be involved in meetings. You have to build shot lists. You have to make sure that, you know, everything stays on top of each other. You're in the media center editing. So what would you say is your approach to staying organized and making sure that everything you do runs smoothly? Yeah, you kind of have a shot list and each client has a different shot list. It's not just me going out and deciding what I want to shoot. Like there is some of that, but a lot of my clients have specific things that they need pictures of. And so I'll have to remember it or take a screenshot of it on my phone. So I don't have to go digging through emails and, you know, I'll, I'll put a piece of paper on my desk with my clients and where I need to deliver pictures to and when I need to deliver them. It, it is a lot more work than people think about. And I've had people on in my comments on TikTok and Instagram saying like, well, you know, it can't be that hard to stand at one corner all day. It's like, no, I'm moving around all day long. I stand at a corner for maybe, maybe 15 or 20 minutes maximum. If I'm trying to do multiple different things, like I'm changing shutter speed, I'm maybe trying different lenses. I'm going to move around a lot. And then I'm going to take those pictures. And you know, when I'm done with that particular section of the track, I might go to another section of track. And then when I'm done with that area, I'll go back and edit and send to my clients. And it really is just, it's like working multiple days or multiple types of photography all in one race. It's really, really challenging and trying to remember, you know, what cars I need to shoot, who needs what, you know, I'm working for drivers. So if I can see what drivers in the car, I need to make sure that they're actually driving the car or make it look like they're, they are in the car for kind of like some of the prototypes, the driver sits on the, on the left side. So if I shoot the car from the right side, I can't see the driver as much. So it's just a picture of the car and it doesn't matter who's driving it. But if I'm shooting from their left side, then you can see who's driving it. So I'm not going to deliver a picture of one driver when it's not my client. It does get challenging where you have to like think about that kind of stuff. And would you say that that is one of the biggest misconceptions about your job? Because you get so many comments on TikTok of people claiming that they know it all, apparently. So what are some of these, you know, common questions you get that you just kind of wish, you know, people would wake up to the fact that that's simply not reality? Yeah, I mean, there was somebody that the other day that was like, well, yeah, it must be pretty easy to, to just take a picture of a car at, you know, one two thousandth of a second and blast through 50 pictures and let the camera do the work. And it's like, yeah, but like the camera didn't walk itself out to that corner and set up in that particular location and frame up that composition and then do it all like it didn't expose the picture. I did it. I did that. And I had to think about it. And it wasn't just an accident. I made that picture. Like I say it all the time. It's like we're not just taking pictures. You're you're not just accidentally tripping over your camera and it fires a frame and it's like, oh, that's nice. Like you're constantly thinking about how to make a picture and how to create something in the camera that doesn't need a lot of work on the computer. Like I'm not going to Photoshop in a bunch of butterflies and dandelions and a sun flare and a rainbow over the car. Like I need to make it what I want it to be in the camera so that I don't have to spend hours after the fact editing pictures because I don't have time to. So I think there's a, there's just a ton of misconceptions about the job just in general as a photographer a motorsport photographer they take for granted that like oh that's a that's that's like my favorite picture of lewis hamilton it's like okay someone 
made that picture. If somebody was holding that camera and composed that shot and waited for Lewis to do something and they had to choose that position they were going to be in. And then the world just sees it. And it's like, oh, that's a cool picture of Lewis Hamilton. And there's no thought whatsoever given to the person behind the camera. It actually really bothers me that like teams especially will just, here's here's our most fire shots from the weekend. It's like, yeah, you, what about your photographers? Like, you're going to give them a shout out for making these? Like, it's, I don't know. It does bother me. Yeah, there's so much more that has to go into it. And, you know, that's why it's considered a, a creative avenue. These teams wouldn't be able to deliver such high quality content if it wasn't for photographers and videographers putting it all together. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to get the same experience. I, I've said it before, and I am I really believe it. But did a race even happen if there's no pictures of it? I mean, yes, it happened, but there isn't much to share about it after the fact if it's just broadcast footage and, and you just watched it on TV. The bulk of the post-race stuff that we talk about or even during a weekend for F1 is really you know, content from photographers, like here's a, here's a sweet shot of Max and Lewis, like fighting for a championship. And, and that's what people want. And I'm even thinking in terms of 2022 testing, it's been revealed that it's behind closed doors. So our first and only perceptions of the new cars that we're going to get is going to be through the lens of photographers that are in attendance. So it's, it's a crucial, crucial position for you know, photographers to be able to give that content to fans, to be able to give that content to media outlets. It's it's hugely important. And and today, I'm lucky that I have a job that I know some people would argue otherwise, but it's not going to be easily or ever automated. It's always going to really take a person standing out there making those pictures and, and that there's a huge demand for it because of social media. Like everybody has their own social media demands. So it's a good problem to have that suddenly all these teams and manufacturers and sponsors and potential clients are like, we need content now, but it also puts a lot of demand on us like to deliver faster. Like when social media came around, everything's changed. Probably for the better, but at the same time, it puts so much more job constraints and job pressure on you guys. And another thing that I kind of wanted to know a little bit more about is you have to really familiarize yourself with so many different track layouts to know where those optimal shots are. From your experience, um, are there any that are more challenging to shoot at than others? Do you have a personal favorite? Monaco is, is all, pretty much all of our favorites, if for no other reason that the proximity to the cars is just spectacular. Like you really don't get that kind of proximity anywhere else on any other street circuit that we go to but yeah you do have to learn the tracks and it's actually very exciting when we all go to a new track when we go to a new venue like Miami we're all going to be learning together as photographers and it's not going to be luck that somebody gets something really spectacular we're going to have to go and scout the track out walk it the day before uh, on usually Thursday and we'll walk it backwards so we can see we're not going to walk it like driver direction we're going to walk it the counter direction so you can see what you're going to see as the cars are coming at you but then forgetting like maybe even finding a nice picture you have to figure out how to get to that spot so it is really challenging but a lot of the tracks that we go to year in and year out it's it's hard it's hard to find something new as far as like a photographer goes you really you really have to start being creative in that in that sense the weather changes so that's good the cars change that's good but the track layout really doesn't change um so you have to figure out you know, I'm going to go out to turn three. How am I going to shoot night turn three differently than it has been for the last 70 something years? It's it's hard. It's really hard to find something different, creative, uh, that's better or worth showing to the world. And kind of going off that, have you ever had an experience where you've done a shoot or you've taken some photos at a location and then only when reflecting afterwards thought, oh, I think I could have done that better. Like, is there anything that you want the opportunity to reshoot again? I don't know if there's like reshoot again, but um, something that's just taken time to to figure out as a photographer is really trusting my gut. And if I'm, if I feel like, well, maybe this is okay. Like I'll, I'll take a couple frames and I'm not like loving it, but I'm not hating it either. Usually if I'm like kind of erring on the side of I'm not hating this, it's probably, uh, it's probably okay. Like it's probably a good picture. And there's been plenty of times where I've gotten back to the media center and I've said, wow, that was actually really nice. I wish I'd done more of that instead of just like three minutes of it and just be like, oh, that's not that nice. I'm going to go somewhere else. And I'm also curious to know, is there any specific race 
track event that you haven't shot yet that you really, really want to? Yeah, Bathurst 1000, the supercars race has always been on my bucket list. It just is an iconic track, but also really cool series, really cool cars. The Isle of Man TT motorcycle race is also like pretty much the top of my bucket list. I'm very thankful that I'm going to be able to check off another one of my bucket list items this year, which is the Daytona 500. I've been fortunate to do the Indy 500. I've done Monaco. I've done Le Mans. I've done Daytona many times. I've done Macau Grand Prix, Singapore. I've done a lot of amazing things, but there's still a couple that I'd love to do. But I think the Isle of Man would be like probably one of the ones that I desperately need to do soon. On the opposite end of things, what would you say is your editing approach and how do you get into a flow for that? Because when you take thousands and thousands of photos on a daily basis, I'm sure you've kind of optimized your work style to be able to get it done at a relatively quick pace. I think something that I learned from my time with newspapers is that editorially, you know, there's there's rules of editorial photography where you really can't do a lot to your pictures. If it's going to run in a newspaper, the, the mentality is, is that you have to shoot something without altering the scene it has to be what's happening in front of you if you didn't get what you want in the camera you can't then go photoshop it in or out i see a lot of photographers heavily rely on photoshop which is fine that's their prerogative but it's not it's not mine and because a lot of the the content that i still make does run in magazines and websites from a race. I don't want to manufacture something. I don't want to add a sun flare if we didn't have sun. And that's just my personal style of, of editing. If I can't edit a picture in five or eight seconds where I'm kind of just doing a little bit of color contrast and a crop, it's not the picture for me. And when I'm delivering hundreds of pictures during the race, like I'll probably deliver over a hundred pictures per client during the race. You know, if I have eight clients, it'll probably be like 800 pictures that I'm delivering between Saturday and Sunday. And if you spend even one minute on each picture, that's 800 minutes. And I don't have that much time. Well, it's nice to see that there's always going to be a degree of authenticity to the photos you bring. Because as you said, like Photoshop is becoming so prevalent. And I do think in a way that Photoshop can be its own separate art form. But when you want to actually be delivering photos of what really happened what it can be like as a fan experiencing only through your phone that can't quite make it to a race you want to be delivering the best of the best but have it be realistic very much so yeah i've had people ask questions or message me like hey i'm a photoshop artist slash motorsport photographer how do i get you know in working with the teams and i'm like to be honest with you the teams don't want one picture a weekend it's like a crazy cool photoshop they want like hundreds they're posting every couple hours during the race and it's not going to be photoshop stuff it's going to be like here's a here's a shot and it's my job to make it as nice as it possibly can be in the camera so that nobody has to do anything to it ideally in lightroom or photoshop they can just throw it straight on instagram or twitter and with these new social media borderline requirements at this point it's very much impacted your job how much you have to deliver but it's also allowed for a lot of personal growth on your own social media platforms. I mean, you have a massive following on TikTok and Instagram. So how has social media itself impacted your career, both in a client sense, as well as your own professional pages? Client wise, it's been, it's been great. The downside is these teams need this content fast. Now it's just very social media needed, needed on stories and 12 minutes, get us a picture of the pit stop or get us a picture of sunset, get us a picture of sunrise. And it, it doesn't matter if I, if I deliver it tomorrow, it's too, it's one day too late. But from a personal side, even though it's made our lives harder as photographers and videographers, it's made things so much easier to interact with fans and share a behind the scenes look at what we're doing and, and how we're doing it and, and show how interesting and cool my job is and how just the the things that people don't get to see because that is a very big theme within your social medias especially you go live as often as you can and really give people that insider access into paddocks into garages and you know you speak to people that are around you and it's a very open and honest approach and i kind of think getting rid of that 
old school style of motorsport personnel keeping things really tight lipped and secretive. So why is that something that you felt was really important to be able to share with your audience? Well, growing the sport or growing the series only benefits me being able to share and put fans in the stands and share with like people like this is a fun event to come to as a photographer. And if even if you're if you don't care about photography, like it's a fun event to come to just like period the end. So being able to show people these cool cars and how open the access is is a lot of fun myself and my friend mark have really like taken it to a kind of a new level where we're really showing people stuff that maybe we shouldn't be showing but it is unfortunate that all series really look at photographers almost as a as a negative more than we are an asset even legally speaking if you really read the contracts that we sign we're probably not allowed to do live content from the paddock but i would seriously push back if they ever if they ever really can't try to come down on us for this and show them why it matters if i could produce one person that bought a ticket it. That's probably worth it, but they don't always see that. So it is frustrating. It is sometimes feeling like we're beating our heads against the wall, trying to promote the series and show behind the scenes what I'm doing because it does matter and people do find it interesting. And that's not my fault. That's just the way it is. I mean, you guys are living proof that people want this type of stuff. Fans are actively seeking out this type of content and they want to engage and ask questions. So you know, more power to you to be able to actually give them that platform to get these answers. So even more reason for people to go follow you. That does lead me into my final question. We've blown through them and it's going to be a question that you receive quite a lot, but I'm going to ask you again. What advice would you give to any aspiring photographers looking to make their way into motorsport? Yeah, there's no hacks to it. It really comes down to you got to just put in the time and and go to races. That's why I keep saying go to IMSA races, go to SRO races, go to lawnmower races, go to dirt track races. Uh, they're all very open, very fan friendly. When I say fan friendly, like, I mean, bring your camera and take pictures. You can learn a lot. You don't need credentials to make beautiful pictures. Put in the time, go to those events, build a portfolio. But remember that nothing happens quickly. Like it's like any job, photography is the exact same. You just have to start at small events and build up your experience and the people you know, which are really is really the most important thing in the entire, you know, advice column of this is like, it's not about the pictures you take. It's about the people you know, because I know a lot of very, average and mediocre photographers all over the world. It's not even that they aren't that good at photography. It's just that they're better at marketing themselves. I would probably put myself in this category, honestly, that I'm better at marketing myself and running a business and meeting people and introducing myself to people that matter in the paddock than I am actually like physically taking a pretty picture because the taking a pretty picture part is the easiest part of all of it. It's really more about who, you know, not just even on like a professional level, like, but a personal level. I'm, I know about my people's lives at home outside of the racetrack and they're, you know, we're friends and it's, it would be very very hard to steal a client off of me because I'm friends with the people that I work with. So I think it's just a just the way things are in general in this modern world that everybody wants it fast and they want it now. Nothing happens quickly and you have to just put in the time and effort. If you keep doing as much as you can and putting in as much effort as you can, it will happen. It will catch. It just it doesn't happen for everybody because they don't they aren't willing to put in the time. A massive thank you to Jamie for taking the time to speak with me and giving us all a lot more insight into the world of motorsport photography. Make sure to check out Jamie's work. All of his socials are linked below. Go give him a follow. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed and we will see you in the next one.